Welcome to the final webinar in the Fall MDM, MDE Accelerated Learning webinar series. My name is Melissa Nantes and I'm with Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center. We are pleased and honored to welcome a dynamic team from Muskegon Heights Public School Academy presenting on Accelerated L Literacy Outcomes, Implementation in Action. I'm going to turn it over to the Muskegon Heights team. Hi, good evening or still afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Arnetta Thompson. I am the proud superintendent here at Muskegon Heights Public School Academy System. And I just want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to share a piece of what um, we consider is our lives um, throughout the school year. Um, we're going to put uh, our presentation up and get started. So um, guaranteeing our legacy, um, our opportunity for accelerated learning outcomes and implementation in action. So I'm going to call your attention first to the left side of this slide. Um, these are some symbols that we have adopted from uh, West Africa. They are named Andikra symbols. And as you go through our presentation, and as you'll see on a lot of the literature that we have moving forward uh, in this process, you'll see one of these symbols. But we feel that the meaning of each of these symbols actually corresponds really well with what we are trying to do in um, creating this legacy here at Muskegon Heights Public School Academy system. And this process started back in 2018 and it started because, <clears throat> excuse me, we noticed that our students weren't able to always see themselves in books, in literature, in, in curriculum. And so what started as a one-time summer project ended up growing into what we started calling our legacy curriculum that we're creating but then we started using the term legacy to actually help guide us through the rest of the work that we do. So this Andinkra symbol is a symbol of imperishability and endurance. Paola Friere says that revolutionary leaders, uh, they need not think without the people nor for the people but only with the people. And so the, through this process of creating curriculum and um, how we operate and educate our students, we have really focused on this symbol and its meaning to help navigate us through this process. Our vision is to cultivate self-empowerment within our community and take informed action towards equity and social justice. And so I'll start here with how we uh, involve the entire community in this process. We initially started out with a small group in central office trying to create a vision of how we were going to move forward with our legacy process. That group started with a jam board and we just posted several different um, words that we thought were um, meaningful in creating a vision. So we just, just stuck them up there. Once we did that, we came back as a group, excuse me, as a smaller subcommittee and then we wordsmithed how we put those words together to create something that was meaningful and drove the work that we did. And that took some time. We, we as the smaller committee, um, met a few times to go over the right size and to recite and redo and edit multiple times. And then we took it to a larger group. So now, not, no, not only central office, then we branched it out to our building leadership 
and then our district. And then we went to the community and parents and they had input. We gave them what we felt was the vision and we asked them, what do you think? Does this sound right? Is this something that you feel honors what you want your students to do and have in our school as we do this process? So this vision was truly created from the whole community of Muskegon Heights. So as we do with most things, especially in presentations, we like to involve as many team members as possible. And uh, as you see, there are multiple team members here. Um, myself, our assistant superintendent, our strategic plan partnership agreement coordinator. We have some teachers, special education director, um, and our ELA coach not only within the district, but also one of our partners outside of the district. And we'll get into partners a little later. And although we just have this snippet of the group, it is truly a unified effort. Um, we could have substituted any teacher, any principal, any other partner in this presentation because we've all walked the walk side by side. So, um, we're honored and each of these people will introduce themselves and what they do a little later. So again, that whole concept of partnering, we were <laughs> vigilant about finding people that were like-minded um, that, that were trying to accomplish the same types of goals we were when we started creating this curriculum and these processes to teach our children. And we reached out sometimes with cold calls um, to see who could help us, what kind of resources they could provide, where, who could they connect us with to get certain things. So we've been working with my MTSS, also with authors, um, Cultivating Genius, Dr. Goldie Muhammad. We have started a book study this summer with her work, and she has started with some professional development with our staff and district and families and community um, with this work in mind and how we're going to implement that throughout the curriculum to help our students really see who they are and, and embrace that in every subject area that we teach. Um, the Museum of African American History, uh, MDE, of course, our community partners um, with our legacy curriculum, uh, parent advocacy committee. Um, so parents from each of our schools come in and meet with us monthly, monthly um, to talk about various um, topics, um, not only the legacy curriculums, but what they see in the school, what they'd like to see in the school. Um, we've also had a great um, relationship with the Carter Center out of, uh, um, oh, is it St. Louis? Uh, it's in Missouri. It's the University of Missouri. So um, Dr. King and his group have really um, been very helpful with helping our, uh, especially secondary uh, staff members, help create lesson plans in the whole process. Um, they weekly, um, throughout the spring, met with our teachers to help in this process. Um, Muskegon ISD, all these partners have joyfully um, lent assistance to help us in this um, journey. So we're happy to be here again, and um, we hope that you learn some valuable information through the process of, a, of us sharing our journey with you. And I will turn it over.
Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, Dr. Thompson alluded to our um, our timeline of how we got started. And I wanna give a little nod to my MTSS because we kind of took one of their mantras on years ago, get started then get better. And that is what we have always believed here in Muskegon Heights. Um, so part of our literacy journey, uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned a summer program that we started in the summer of 2018. And that's what we called Summer Reading Rocks where we mailed books home to our um, to our children and families to build home libraries. And then from there, we started to build upon that work um, after we were awarded a Learning for Justice Educator Grant and Learning for Justice, in case you're not familiar, um, it was formerly the Teaching Tolerance um, Organization and they have had a name change. So we were granted um, a modest, but really inspiring grant for us to get started with what we have come to call our legacy curriculum. And that's um, the focus of our legacy curriculum is uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned in our vision, we really wanna make sure that our curriculum uh, is a mirror for our children and celebrates their identity. So that was really, um, it was a great start to this work for us. So that was October of 2019. <clears throat> and then throughout October two, uh, from that point on through July of tw uh, 2020, we really did a lot of networking and learning. Um, Dr. Thompson mentioned cold calls and the um, partners that we just saw in the previous slide. Um, it took a, it took a minute to build relationships and even figure out who who might be willing, able, have you know have the time to to support this work. Um, and we had to do a lot of learning during that process as well. So then from there, we were able to build a leadership team in the summer of um, uh, 2020. And uh, it, that was a really great process where our team came together and we each kind of took different components of our curriculum work. And um, we just met weekly and we gave each other updates and then we worked kind of with subcommittees throughout um, throughout the interim weeks in between. And then we, um, we built onto that in November of last year, we added our legacy curriculum community committee. And that's where members of our community joined, the, joined us in the work to give us feedback, to help guide us. And so that program or that, that committee is still up and running uh, this year. So we've continued it again. And then into January, March, um, January through March of 2021, this was one of the partners that Dr. Thompson mentioned. Um, Angela Joy, who wrote, who wrote Black as a Rainbow Color was another cold call. We just reached out to her and we said, um, we wanna send your book home to all of our families. Will you join us? And she just jumped in with both feet and was an amazing partner in that. And then spring of 2020, we got the awesome news that we were awarded the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant, which was, it gets that big wow on top because we were already doing a lot of this work, but this really opened so many doors to us because um, it allows us to have the funding to put behind these dreams that we have for our children and, um, and our community as far as literacy is concerned. So from that, we just hit the ground running after we got that, um, that literacy grant. Um, and we worked toward uh, Black as a Rainbow Color. We, we built a mur mural with our children, with a local artist that our community voted on. Um, and then we started doing some legacy curriculum book clubs throughout the spring and uh, into the summer of last year. Um, also in the spring of last year, we, we were able to forge a partnership with Goldie, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who we'll talk a little bit more about later in our presentation. And then over the summer of 2021, we built out a literacy expert plan where, with our goal being every um, teacher being a, a literacy expert. Uh, and then finally, um, we started implementing an enhanced literacy curriculum, which we'll also learn more, uh, also talk more about this afternoon. And that launched this summer. And something that we have to note, uh, COVID-19 pandemic struck all of us in March of 2020. And, this work did not stop for us. We just had to keep, um, we had to keep focused and keep our vision at the forefront. So um, it is something to look back on when you see it all put out in a timeline like this. It's a lot to, um, it's a lot to be proud of. And then you see at the end of the that that table there, we are not done yet. So we have, we definitely have more to do. So part of our vision, um, from from the vision and our work with Dr. Goldie Muhammad, we were able to build out some literacy goals. Um, all built around Dr. Muhammad's historically responsive literacy framework. And you'll see some pieces that we have taken and we've kind of aligned much of our work to the components of the framework. And these are what uh, Dr. Muhammad calls the literacy pursuits. So we had focus on identity through our um, home library collections and a book that we're using this year, similar to um, Angela Joy's Black as a Rainbow Color last year. We're gonna be focusing on Kwame Alexander's Undefeated this year. 
Um, we'll learn more about our skills that we're all building, both us adults as learners and our children as learners, and um, our work that Dr. Uh, Thompson mentioned around cultivating genius. So we are building our own intellectual capacity, and we are in progress toward the other pursuits of criticality, a call to action, and joy. So the next slide shows um, a little bit more about our literacy plan. And there's a lot here. You see a lot of check marks, but really the thing to focus on um, is the, the learning and dedication that all of our team members devoted over this past summer. You notice members of the team, um, they devoted 99 hours over last summer um, to all of this learning. Letters, online professional development, cultivating genius, and learning a new curriculum. And you'll learn a little bit more about each of those in just a minute. Um, but really it speaks to the dedication and the commitment to all of our instructional staff members. And I just wanna be really clear when we say that, we're talking about um, our deans, we have all of our specials teachers, our electives teachers, every single instructional staff member was part of this work to become a literacy expert. And Heidi's gonna share a little bit more about our outcomes of our summer work. Yes, hello, thank you, Jen. Um, I am Heidi, I am the special education director. And so our progress through the summer of 2021, um, all of those additional hours and dedication that our staff put into it, um, this is where we are standing at the end of the summer of 2021. 89% um, of our staff completed the letters online course, which I'm super excited to dig into next with you all. Um, our reading mastery, which is our intervention reading curriculum training, we were able to get 96% of our staff trained in that this summer. And then our cultivating genius uh, book response, independent reading and response, which was 16 hours, 70% uh, of our staff completed over the summer. We're still continuing to do that work. So these are rolling percentages. That was the that was data uh, one data point at the end of the summer. Um, we've had the privilege of being able to hire several new staff that are just as passionate as we are about literacy. And so they are completing Letters Volume 1 right now. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more. I will lead you through um, some of the supplemental curriculum we as adults went through in order to get ready to bring the science of literacy to our to our students, right? We um, we, took a, we are taking a letters course, and through all of this, we're learning that the human brain is hardwired for language, but it is not hardwired for reading, which was a little bit of a mind blow for a lot of us, I believe. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that reading rope in just a minute, but um, you know, it's based on the science of reading. So our, our next step that we did with letters was based on the science of reading. We'll go to the next slide. And you've heard us say the word letters, which is actually not a word. It stands for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. And if you notice, one of the symbols that ground us in our work is also on this slide because it's the symbol of knowledge, lifelong education, and the continued quest for knowledge, right? James Baldwin says the purpose of education is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself and to make his own decisions. And we, um, as a district, as a family, believe that learning is lifelong. So when we say that we all went through this language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling course, that we all became experts and we all took this course together, all of us, from Dr. Thompson on down took this letters training course. And so we'll dig into it just a little bit on the next slide. I have a little bit of a task for you to complete. Um, so some of the things we went through during this course, and it was an independent learning course, we'll talk a minute about that, but um, just take a minute in your brains, in your own brains, to think about what you think best describes the activity of the reading brain in proficient readers compared to beginning readers. Is it A, that it's more consciously planned? Is it B, that it involves more different regions? Is it C, that it's more automatic? Or is it D, that it's about the same? I want you to think of your answer in your brain. And I'm gonna tell you in five seconds of wait time that the answer is C. Okay, and it is more automatic, which stands for automaticity. And automaticity means it is the ability to read quickly and accurately without conscious effort. 
So th that's just an example of one of the questions that we had to answer as we moved through this course, um, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. And on the next slide, we have just a little touch of some of the diagrams and, and points that we learned. So the, the concept around language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling is that word recognition is a multiplication, simple view of reading is that it's a multiplication problem. Okay, you have to have word recognition multiplied with language comprehension in order to get reading comprehension and that it all stems from the brain. Um, we talked about phonological awareness. We talked about orthography. Um, so it's all simply about the science of reading and what goes on inside of the brain while we're while we are reading, while we are learning to read, and it breaks it down. So volume one, and this is how we learn. On the next slide, you'll see a little bit about how we did this. Um, we it, it's an on, online independent learning course. So it takes about 66 hours plus or minus. Um, there's a book, there's a, a book that you use, then there's the online course where you watch videos and you learned a little bit more about it. Um, and then you took quizzes and unit tests throughout the sections that you had to perform, you know, that you had to score at an 80% or better. So some of the things that we did in the how we learned so that we could kind of share the experience, despite it being online and independent, is we um, created a Google Classroom where we would have announcements, tips, some shared materials. A few of us created some scope and sequences for people to follow. Um, some of us who are um, procrastinators completed a procrastinator's guide for how much time to spend. We created some shared study groups um, because even though it's an independent online course, we really did not want to anyone to feel like they were alone in this learning. And then this fall, when we came back to school, we had weekly webinar classes on Wednesdays, depending on our grade level, so that we could share some learning together, which was helpful as well. Um, on the next slide, back into some of the what we learned. So um, we're just giving you a little taste, a little teaser of this course. Um, you know, it talks about, it, it talked about explicit instruction, the vowel valley sound walls, um, Aries phrases, which is within its description of student characteristics and instructional goals and activities. Those, th those types of things, if you know where a student is in Aries phases, you can then form your instruction and differentiation around it. it Explain to us a little bit about orthography and explains it to us in a way that helped us better understand um, the how and the why of English spelling, which as we all know is not necessarily um, an easy task for our children or for us to complete. Um, it gave hands-on practical ways to teach the skills that they were giving us um, as we learned. There were things like word practice routines. Um, we graphed phonemes and graphemes to kind of understand a little bit better what our students are going through when we learn to read, because as adults, for the most part, reading is automatic for us at this point. And if I don't know about you all, but I can't remember how I learned to read. It was all too long ago. Um, when we, we did a little bit more about syllabication. Um, some, of the, some of the things that surprised us on the next slide, um, it, it, it really, it, it tied reading back to how the brain works, right? Someone somewhere, a bunch of scientists got together, figured out how the brain works, and then helped us use that knowledge to teach reading effectively. Um, it gave us the why behind most words are spelled the way they are. Um, you know, uh, several teachers and, and a lot of us have thought before this course, it seemed like there was really no rhyme or reason around why certain words are spelled the way they're spelled. But this ties it back to the history of words. It ties it back to brain research. Um, another surprising moment, especially for me, was nonsense word fluency. And how well, it matters more than we realize because it all goes back to making sure that reading becomes an automatic process for us. Um, and then another insight that surprised us was that the historical layers of English can and should inform when we teach morpheme structures. Um, there's so much more around the course itself um, within the course that surprised us. It's, it's packed full of learning and understanding 
Um, it was a really, really good, good course to take. And on the next slide, we do have some advice, you know, moving forward as a district. Um, we did the, we did volume one in the summer and we're going to be uh, going into letters volume two here in a little while as well. But there were some, there was some debate within the district around, should you do the online work first or should you do the book first or should you do them together? Um, a lot of teachers found doing the online work first and then reading the book was helpful. I think you have to find your own, your own strength and way to do that. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's a resource for information that you might need. So as you learn it and you absorb it, the, the book itself is full of strategies, full of ways to do things and full of ways when you have a struggling reader in your class and you hear something that sounds familiar, it gives you one source to go back to, to look for strategies because it takes the, the, the reading concept, but then it takes it further and gives you strategies for how to teach it. Practical, hands-on ways for you, for you to teach that strategy if a student is having difficulty. Um, one of the things that, that we thought about, there's a bridge to practice piece, which is wonderful, where you take what you've learned in a unit and then you go apply it to a group of students or to your class. Um, doing the work in the summer, it was a little bit more of a barrier to try and get those bridges to practice done with students. We were able to pair some summer tutoring, which was helpful, but it's definitely the biggest piece of advice was to use the bridge to practice effectively, you do need to have some access to students so that you can apply that learning immediately. Um, Ms. Kurtz, did I forget anything as our as our resident expert? No, I think the, the thing that I would add to is that the letters manual itself becomes a reference. And so um, these slides and some of the images and the learning come back to a, um, a resource that, that people are referring to. And as an ELA coach, uh, I'm able to pull exercises that will help a student with this particular challenge um, and uh, help a teacher refer a teacher to remember when we did this and here's, here's where that is. And that helps them better connect it with the students learning at, at the time. So that's a great aspect of what letters offered as well. And it, it does, it really does, it, it does dig right into your long-term memory. So as, as you're in a classroom and you're listening to a student, you can remember it, it, you are able to see, break down words and, and move forward and then use it as a, as a reference. It really, it, it's changed. I hear it in the hallways all the time. It's changed the way we talk about students and, as readers and it's, mm -hmm. and it's just delightful. I think the other thing while we, while we're switching yeah. slides, the other thing that I would add to that is that, um, working through the letters, like Heidi said, it changes the conversation, but it also is like the the college level, grad level class. It's not a curriculum. It's the grad level class that informs how we teach and how we understand the curriculums that we're using. And I think that's a, a question a lot of people have asked when they hear about letters, be it the teachers or the staff or the parents, well, when are we doing this curriculum? It's not the curriculum, it's the it's the information piece. It's the, the coursework that informs what we're doing in the classroom. Yes, thank you. And then as the what's next, right? So we are gonna do letters volume two, continue our learning so that we can continue to become experts in reading. Um, and it'll be the same type of format. We'll have the online coursework, we'll have the textbook, a scope and a sequence, and then we'll have webinars together as groups so we can kind of discuss and do our bridge to practice by applying our learning to the classroom. And then the next step is gonna be what the next group is going to explain to you with our reading mastery. Hello, everybody. My name is Christine Kerr, and I am one of the ELA coaches for Muskegon Heights. We'll go ahead and introduce our group here, and then we'll we'll dive into these slides. I am Brenda Rybacki. I am one of the elementary teachers at Muskegon Heights. My name is Jody Jurgens. I have the honor of partnering with Muskegon Heights through the Muskegon ISD as a literacy coach. 
Yeah, and we are so excited to get to share with you our reading mastery, reading intervention that we have been implementing. I and mean, we feel that corresponds really well with the, the symbol of, of knowledge, lifelong education, and a continued quest for knowledge that we want to get our students to build the skills that we need for reading and just, you know, really take off towards that quest for knowledge. And not only that, but us as, as we've seen, okay, what do our students need? How can we support them and how can we keep them moving forward? So as we go to the next slide here, um, we are using these two curriculums during our reading mastery intervention block um, based on the science of reading that Heidi just shared with you with letters. It's so neat to be able to, to connect our, our letters concepts with our curriculum that we're using. We have our reading mastery, um, which spans um, K-5, um, and we have a lot of groups that are doing the um, kindergarten and, and first levels. And then we also have this corrective reading program. And that correct corrective reading curriculum is um, used with our third through sixth grade students, particularly. Um, Brenda can probably speak a little bit more to what that one's like. All right, so our corrective reading program, this is a decoding program where we work on several different components of it. The first one is sounds of the letters. It is letter combination sounds, and it is writing sentences with those sounds. The other part of the program that we work on with the corrective reading is we start reading stories and answering comprehension questions. The story is always broken down into three different parts. And after each part, you will ask four different comprehension questions. Most of our third through fifth grade fall in anywhere from the Reading Mastery to the Decoding B1 series. And we do have some that have gone into the other Decoding B2 series. And right now, our main goal is to get them out of the B1 and get them into the DB2 or to get them into the reading mastery part of it. Great. Uh so with our reading mastery and corrective reading curriculum, if we can move to the next slide. Um, the, both of those curriculums are what we would call, you know, explicit instruction or direct instruction. So that's going to mean that there's a routine and lots of procedures and And so within that, you know, that's kind of based on that, that science of reading that we want to make within sure that, that our kiddos are kiddos. getting what um, the, the things that they need to be able to make those connections in their brain and, and do well. Um, so you can see on the, the side that we're asking children to crack a code. So in these programs, rather than asking them to guess out a word based on what um, the picture shows um, or what the word might look like. We're asking students to use their, um, the decoding skills that we're developing with them to be able to read those words and figure out those words through the decoding or sounding out. Um, so with that, you'll see there's a, a picture of, of some words like nose and old and rocks. And you'll see that those don't look like a traditional font. This is an example of the font that is utilized for our kindergarten and first grade students that the program has developed this font to really help kiddos crack that, that code of reading. So for example, you can see that the in nose that silent E is smaller so that students are focusing on that sound. And You'll also see a sample lesson here that with that direct instruction that both of reading mastery and corrective reading, our 
are scripted programs. And so the teachers are told what to say. They're given correction procedures that if students are um, not answering correctly that they can get specific feedback to be able to make improvements. Students are given individualized opportunities to practice as well. Um, and then there are also different things like fluency checks and mastery tests along the way that we can use as formative assessments or progress monitoring to be able to determine where our students are and how they're doing. As we move on to the next slide, you'll see kind of a breakdown of what our intervention programs kind of, of look like or what that process has been. So first, it started in this our spring of 2021 during our remote learning. And we did some individual placement testing with students to determine what curriculum and what level in that curriculum would really be the best fit for them. So that was done by some amazing staff that worked one-on-one -on -one with students while they were remote to do those placements. Then when we came back in the fall, we were able to do a few more, you know, in-person placement tests, get our, our new students placed um, so that they were ready for our intervention blocks. Um, this intervention block takes place with all of our students in grades K through six. So we have an Edgewood Elementary, which is a K-1 building, and Martin Luther King Academy, which is a two through six building. And so both of those buildings have their own intervention block time in the morning, which is about an hour. Within that, we have 16 classrooms represented, and it's broken down into 32 small groups so that we're able to have most groups be at that ratio of 10 students to one adult, which really gives them that personalized custom reading instruction and allows them to really engage and participate. And as mentioned before, uh, by Dr. Thompson, I believe every adult here is a literacy teacher. And so it's it's super exciting as a coach to be able to walk the halls and see not only classroom teachers, but our, our deans of students and our, our specials teachers, um, our resource team helping with that. Um, also, we have um, instructional assistants and our grandparents from our United Way program we have about four grand, three or four grandparents, I believe, that have offered to take groups. So they have some of the smaller groups and the kids just love getting that one-on-one um, -on -one really, you know, individualized attention with those, those grandparents. So that has been really, really great. Um, we even have, you know, our, our coaches and administrators that are um, very in involved and, and invested in our program as we've been been going along. So we'll often see them volunteering or, or stepping in or leading groups as well. So over the summer, we started launching some of these, and it was just a great chance for teachers and students to get into the routine before fall started. Um, in summer school, we had a chance to bring the children back in the building, frame the building for all week. So this was an opportunity to get them back in. But some challenges that did come up for us at this point, as you can imagine, almost 18 months without them being in the building, getting these students to get a routine going, getting to expectations that came in. And forty brochures, and we were moving a hundred and four about
Okay, it looks like Brenda's having some issues with internet. So I'm not sure if we should just move forward um, to some of the areas I plan to discuss and hopefully she can come back. It looks like slide 28 is where I started my work. So if we could skip to that slide. All right. Um, just to sort of reintroduce myself really quick, um, I have had the honor to partner with Muskegon Heights through the Muskegon ISD. So this is my first year working with Muskegon Heights. Um, it was my first time meeting teachers, meeting the students, and they have all of these huge, exciting, wonderful things going on. Um, there was so much to take in and very quickly. I know the start of the school year is crazy enough as it is. Um, the training modules that they provided through um, the online portion of Reading Mastery were a great starting point. They have excellent videos where teachers were modeling the, the lessons in a small group setting. It really gave you a feel for what those intervention times were going to look like, especially at different grade levels as well. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to step in and teach for a period of time. So for the last 12 or more days, I've had my own group for Reading Mastery and it has expanded my knowledge around the program exponentially. It has given me the opportunity to look and see what is going well and where teachers may need some more support outside of just what we see when we're in observing. Um, things like getting to a certain point and, oh, where do we go next for the assessment and where do we need to look for that? There were so many materials that were provided to teachers that, and I say so many because I was a part of helping Shelly and Christine get them sorted for <laughs> every level, for every teacher, for every group. So it was a lot and coming in without much experience with reading mastery, um, you know, I had the opportunity to see all of the different pieces and how they worked, but for every level, it was a lot. So being able to teach my own K-level group and really get a feel for, okay, now where do I need to go to find that assessment or when might those Black Line Masters be appropriate? It just really gave me a feel of how well-rounded this program is and how well it's built to support the teachers that are using it but then also how we can help support them in finding those resources. And then I think moving into the next slide. Um, I know Brenda, when we lost her, was just getting ready to talk about some of those challenges that she saw in the beginning. And I feel like I had a really unique experience because I was able to be a part of when Edgewood, the K-1 building, started implementing their interventions. And then I was also there for the MLK implementation as well. So I saw it in two different buildings at two separate times. And I can definitely speak to those challenges. Getting those kiddos used to the transitions was huge, especially at K-1, as you can imagine. Um, but I was very impressed with how well they picked up on it. And it really just fell into place pretty quickly, even for the youngest students. Getting those routines and expectations laid out is definitely an area that I think we're still working to support. Um, and it, it's a huge piece. It's a huge piece of that intervention time because when you only have an hour with those students, you really want to be able to utilize that time as much as possible and having that solid groundwork laid with expectations in the routine so they know what is next is huge. Um, I can speak from the view of somebody who is teaching the program. There's a learning curve. There really is. Even with that script and this is what you say, it is so nice to start to feel like I'm at a point where I don't have to constantly check the book or check the screen or, oh, what was I supposed to do for that correction? Because it's such a systematic program. 
that what works in one situation applies pretty easily to another as well. And you get in the flow. And I'm excited to see where teachers can go when we return from Thanksgiving break, now that they've had that opportunity to learn the program and get some of that verbiage under their belts. Um, a huge, huge piece of this too, as I mentioned, being new to the district, I have had the opportunity to form relationships with students that I may have otherwise not met up till this point. Um, I feel like that is a big part of this building wide intervention as well. Those students are bonding and having the opportunity to form a trusted connection with an adult in the building outside of their classroom. So it's really helping to foster that community feel. And even in the short time that I've been doing it, I can tell you I love those kids with every piece of me. Like it, it's just wonderful to see them in the hallway and to, and to get a big hug from them. So curriculum aside, that relationship piece of this building-wide intervention program has been amazing. It's huge. Um, looking ahead, we have had the opportunity to do some deeper diving into all of those materials that were provided. And I've also been exploring a lot of the online materials. Shelly and Christine may have had a chance to do a little more work with this, but I'm excited to see how we can really utilize all of the additional online materials that Reading Mastery has to offer and what that could look like for teachers in their classrooms, even outside of the Reading Mastery time. We are super excited because we've been doing a lot of assessments and collecting so much data to be able to look and see what kiddos are ready to move on and join a higher level group. And I can tell you just from today, I had a student just like flying through. I had to grab three of the presentation books because the growth that she made was just astounding. Um, and it's really exciting to have the opportunity to, to see all of that in print how much growth they made in such little time, especially when you consider that they are still getting used to routines and expectations and teachers are still learning the program. And I am really looking forward to seeing where this program will take the district. So we're gonna jump back to the summer school um, and just review a couple things since um, Brenda had to leave us for that time. But um, I think that for summer school coming in and it being a new program, it goes back to what was mentioned earlier, get started, then get better. And um, we've seen that take place as Jody was talking about now that we're into the fall program, but the summer program was teachers learning after um, just a little bit of, of training. Um, so they had been trained in June and in July, we were launching this program with students face-to-face. -face. And so, um, we had to figure out how to get students from um, that hadn't been in a school building and had never been in this school building, some of the little guys, uh, to the correct places. And what does that look like even just with the placement testing that was done over um, uh, virtual learning in the spring? And some of those students needed to be tested still and teachers were still learning that piece of the puzzle as well. And so Christine, you can jump in at any time um, with that as well. But those uh, learning routines and the curriculum pieces and, and the online access and resources uh, were significant. And again, that direct um, instruction piece uh, in ways made it easier. Uh, and yet at the same time, teachers like to teach and we like to um, engage the students differently. And, and so that learning curve that Jody mentioned as well was a big part of that. I think we go to the next slide here. And um, Christine, if you wanna mention some of those positives and then I'll fill in a little bit. Great. Um, so some of the positive things, and um, a lot of these kind of come from that that teacher perspective as well, um, is that the, the routine and, and the structure. And we can tell that our, our staff really appreciates that. So each lesson follows the same format. Um, and then just, you know, having students have that consistency is, is so great. I was talking to um, a teacher during a grade level team meeting the other day, and they said that, man, the, the first time, the first few days that we did this, it was really difficult to get a whole lesson done in a, 
a day. But now, several weeks later, as students are comfortable in mastering their routines, they're saying, we're getting our lessons done in 30 to 35 minutes now that we're able to have that routine and those those predictable procedures. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that was noticed that um, students really adapted quickly to changing rooms. There was a lot of hesitancy at the beginning relating to our transitioning and, oh, we're going to get all the students in the hall at once to all go to different classes. And people weren't quite sure how it was going to work. Um, and as I'll, I'll talk later, there were some specific things we did to help, you know, make those transitions easier for adults and students, and they really have thrived with it. And it took a lot less time than I thought for us to get those transitions down pat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and students are learning that quickly. They're learning hand signals quickly. They're they're really positive and, and they're ex excited to go to reading mastery, that that's something they look forward to. They have a lot of pride in getting a, to be able to walk down the hall or our second graders that get to go up the stairs to another room, you know, they, they just really like that. And it's been cool to see them really thriving in this. Um, and even Brenda was going to mention that in three weeks of, of summer school, there's just been, you know, even those small gains, we've seen those, you know, impacting students. And even now after just, you know, a, a few weeks or a few months, depending on the school building, because we started at different times, there are, you know, teachers even saying, I am seeing, you know, this growth, I'm seeing improvement already. And, and that has been so great um, to just start to see everybody thriving in, in this. It's been really wonderful. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about um, another experience that we got to have. I know, like as Jody was saying, it's been great to be able to experience teaching, you know, even as coaches, just to be in that teacher position with the kids. It's really helped us to be hands-on and immersed in that curriculum. And that's another thing that a lot of teachers got to do this summer with some tutoring. So um, corrective reading and reading mastery were utilized in our summer school program, as Brenda mentioned. Um, and also teachers had that opportunity to do um, summer tutoring. So each teacher got assigned to maybe, you know, two or three students to do, to meet with weekly for, um, our goal was to have 12 sessions. So some people did three times a week, some did twice a week. Um, it really kind of depended on the, the teacher working with the parents to figure out that that schedule and what would really work best. Um, and a lot of teachers chose to do that summer tutoring online. Um, personally, with the group that I had, um, I had one student out of my group of three that was able to um, communicate with me about getting together to have a group. So we actually met at the public library. And so him and I and um, the, his adult um, got to sit and, you know, kind of walk through this together. So we did a session uh, each time that we met. We met for about half an hour, um, a few times a week. And that was really great for me to just get to experience the first grade curriculum and see what does it look like to do these word attack activities mm -hmm. and get out the storybook and do those. And since it was just um, him and I, we also did the worksheet portion just so I could really get to experience what are those worksheets like? How do the directions in, in the book connect with the, the worksheets? Um, because there aren't worksheets directions printed there. Mm -hmm. There are oral directions that students get from the teacher's presentation book. And so it was really great to be able to have that experience. And, and he was just so excited. And I even see him around school and he'll, you know, hey, you remember when we did this? Look, we're doing this now. And I'm, I'm at a farther level now. And it's, it's great to just to see and share in that um, excitement. Um, now, to add a little bit more about our intervention blocks from the coaching perspective here, um, Shelly and Jody and I have all worked very hard to um, 
help make sure that everybody was feeling excited and confident and comfortable and, and ready to start. As this was a, a big undertaking, a new curriculum for teachers um, and, you know, just something totally different than what's been done before, like with the transitioning. Um, and so we've done a lot of things, as has been mentioned, like assessing students using those placement tests to figure out what group their students need to be as teachers are getting more comfortable, some of them are noticing, man, there's some students like Jody said that are really making great gains. Can we have them reassess to see if there might be a place that's a better fit for them to help them to keep growing while the students that are you know, still at a different level in their group can, can keep working on that. So we've been doing those kinds of things too, which is, is really exciting. Um, as coaches, we are, or we have also been involved in the group placement and helping to get, you know, teachers and students grouped with our group placement. We've also done a lot of different things like making name tags to help with getting transitions to be smoother and um, creating Shelly and Jody worked and made these amazing tubs that teachers could have, especially for some of those, um, the support staff that were um, being leaders in this too, and not having a classroom, we were able to provide them with resources that they could carry with them to their reading mastery location. Um, and so that they would have everything that they would need that they, they might not necessarily have on hand, not having a, you know, having an office rather than a traditional um, place. So, we also did a lot with teacher training and that that looked really different as Heidi had mentioned a vast majority of our teachers were able to do either the corrective reading or the reading mastery training and they did that in the summer in the fall and um, Shelly also did a great job of leading a training with some of our foster grandparents or some of the the newer teachers that weren't here yet when we had that training so that she was able to give them that in-person support which was really great um, we also have as i think jody mentioned some modules online that um, come with our program and that's really great to be able to go back and reference for example there's a great tool in those modules that will pronounce the sounds so that teachers can understand what those sounds or those phonemes are supposed to be like so that they can model those correctly for their students um, and that that's really exciting um, we also have been working on making sure that we give our teachers different resources through email like little tips and tricks and and things that we might have noticed through observations mm -hmm. that teachers could, you know, build on or that we can provide, provide support and we try to, you know, communicate and give, you know, little training emails as we go to just to help now that we're getting familiar with things, how can we take this to the next level and everything. And as coaches, you know, we continue to support as well through things like modeling. Um, that's something that I really enjoy going into a group and getting to walk through parts of a lesson that maybe the leader has, has requested. And then later we can have that conversation of, you know, what are some of those best practices? What are we seeing um, that you can take now and you can use with your group? That's been really great. Um, we uh, also have a huge team of of you know, administrators and us coaches that um, will go in and observe and provide feedback that, you know, we look for different things, you know, like to, for the fidelity of the program, such as, you know, engagement, sticking to the script, um, so that we can just make sure we're, we're seeing and knowing how our team is doing so that we can really support them where they need that. And then with that comes those feedback cycles, which are so important mm -hmm. to be able to say, here, here's things that I'm noticing you're doing well. What are some things that you feel like you want to work on? And just being able to have those conversations to really um, enhance um, the, the teacher's skills, which then is going to help our readers to become even better readers. So it has been super exciting to get to be a part of this, this program mm -hmm. and getting to do this work um, with and for our, our students. I think the only thing I would add before we go to the next um, slide would be that it, we were able to implement one building before the other. And so in doing that, that also gave us, again, a way to get better 
and improve um, as we were doing it. And so in, in some ways we've had three starts to this and that was a exciting part. And so um, uh, thanks for uh, letting us step in and, and kind of catch that up where Brenda had to step out and um, we'll jump into, I think we, are, did we already cover, uh, we're adjusting the groups. I believe we um, mentioned that and um, uh, the curriculum calls for that, that as you're getting to certain points, reassess, look at the data, look at the assessment pieces. And so uh, as was mentioned, these, these little reading groups are becoming teams and the kids are excited and they're in my group. And even today, as I was in the lunchroom, I heard kids saying, hey, they're in my group. And no, they, they're my friend from Reading Mastery. And so that was super exciting to see that piece of the puzzle as well. And so um, as they get to know each other in the groups, um, my office space is used and shared with a group and at, at, on occasion I'm in there. And at some points I hear um, the kids helping each other in the groups and uh, doing really good positive um, interactions with sounding it out instead of just saying the word they're helping the kids each other sound out the words and we see that coming into our other pieces of the curriculum outside of reading mastery in all of the grade levels um, where we're uh, using our reading interventions so that was our reading mastery and now we're going to jump into our rewards program which is our secondary um, reading intervention and so Again, this is something that has been um, started and we're improving and uh, rewards has been done for a few years in the Muskegon Heights system. And so it was somewhat familiar, but we've also have a lot of different staff. And so um, the training was significant and um, last year it was done online with COVID. Um, virtual learning. Uh, and so that has been a, um, a learning curve, again, for the teachers with the curriculum and how that works. And uh, again, they have that knowledge base that's very different because of our letters training. And so uh, high school staff went through that as well. And coming from a high school secondary um, experience as a teacher, um, teaching sounds wasn't something that was uh, a, a part of my training as an English teacher in that same way as it would have been for an elementary teacher. And so I think our secondary teachers had such a big learning curve with that curriculum and then um, to step into this uh, rewards program. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, rewards is a program that works with um, uh, decoding. And um, so that purpose of that is just to really um, lean into that um, uh, focus on prefixes and suffixes of the words and then the vowel sounds. And so um, like our reading mastery program, where about 85% of the curriculum, the sounds, the words are repeated in every lesson, uh, the rewards program repeats the suffixes and prefixes in, in a variety of formats so that they're learning that and they're learning those vowel sounds when we decode words our brain from our letters training we know that it's picking up the beginning the ending and that middle piece which is um which are vowels and so that's how our our processing works um when we get to know those sounds well and so um 80 percent of our uh english language is uh, multi-syllabic words so you have those various words and our kids, when we did our pre-testing with the students as we were going through this, every teacher found that the kids were getting the prefix and maybe the second syllable of the word. But when it got to three syllables or four syllables, though they were missing the suffix. They were, they were just making up whatever uh, word their brain pulled out of familiarity rather than sounding it out and decoding it properly. And so I think that was an aha moment in our pre-testing as we were going through with this. And um, Tyler will talk maybe a little bit more about that as we go. Um, we use our advisory uh, about 30 minutes um, 
as a, uh, a space for rewards. Every student who is not at Benchmark is in a rewards group. And um, our grouping is, is pretty sporadic right now. We didn't have the pre-testing done when we were scheduling. And so we're in the process as we're entering the second marking period of regrouping the students based on our pre-testing data and um, some of our uh, other testing um, for reading that we can align the students a little bit better based on those benchmarks and based on those scores. So our reading levels and that that allows our groups to focus where they're needed. Um, the curriculum is divided into two different sections. One, um, the first 13 lessons, it's 20 lesson curriculum and it takes a couple days, uh, usually about two days once they get the pacing of the lesson and the kids get the familiarity of it. Um, we uh, have all types of challenges um, with our groups and sizing and balancing and um, uh, after lunch or before lunch and, and some of those settings and dynamics that take place as well. Um, we pay attention to the observations of the fidelity or the direct instruction. It's a direct instruction program. And so that's a big part of it as well as um, learning and what that learning curve looks like. Um, and so I just wanna show you a quick clip of um, this is a lesson and uh, we'll get, let um, that slide come up and um, barring any tech issues, we'll just play that for a little bit so you can get an idea of the back and forth that takes place. This was a slide uh, video that was shown during COVID learning and so um, the responses we won't hear from the students, but you'll get a feel for what that curriculum looks like. So go ahead and play that. Lesson two, activity A. Open your student book for lesson two, page seven. Listen, I'm going to say the parts of a word you're going to say the whole word. Incomplete. What word? Incomplete. That's right. Incomplete. I'll say the parts. You say the word. Listen. Correspond. What word? Correspond. That's right. Correspond. Reconsider. What word? Reconsider. Complication. What word? Complication. Incapable. What word? We'll stop there. Um, but that is a great. Uh, that's a, a great introduction to kind of how the curriculum works. It's a back and forth, and and Mr. Harmon in this case had really good pacing. Of, of course, it's it's it was video um, driven and, and designed that way. But those were that um, gives you a feel for how that piece works. And, and in this introductory lesson, this was lesson two, so they're still learning routines. It really was about decoding and they're not looking, they, they see the word and um, this particular exercise, it's just repeat, repeating and getting, getting used to those different parts of the puzzle. And so that was a, a piece of that. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And in this, we'll see, um, In this, we'll see just some reflections. Our, our principal, Ms. Patton, wasn't able to be here this afternoon, but, um, and the teacher's names are listed there and, and the scores that they have and just kind of the average of scores for pre-testing, post, or we'll do post-testing at two other points in the school year. And then we also did the San Diego um, uh, assessment for reading levels and just get some, um, got some feedback that way. And what we saw as teachers, um, uh, Ms. Patton and I both came alongside teachers and, and helped get that uh, work done in those areas. And what we saw is the students' um, scores actually seemed to be higher than their benchmark state assessment scores because what we, what we're guessing, um, we'll see how that goes, uh, but our hypothesis is that the kids in our building tend to respond relationally and being in that smaller setting, 
where we're one-on-one -on -one with them when we were giving these tests really made a difference in um, the feedback that we could give them. I know that the students that I tested, I was able to say, hey, you did a great job, but do you know what? Rewards is going to offer you the opportunity. You missed the endings of the words, but you're going to learn that in this time and in our rewards program. And, and um, I actually tested a lot of my kids in the library and we, uh, we had talked earlier about our Reading Rocks program and giving books and building home libraries. And, and so I was able to say, here's three or four different books that are in this reading level. And, and they were excited to take a book home. And so that was kind of a side benefit, but certainly those conversations that we're able to have with the students when we're doing these, I think uh, as teachers, we miss those a lot um, because it's, it's busy all the time. And um, that was a unique opportunity that this program offered as well. And so the teachers are attempting to work through the lessons. It's a learning curve for them. Um, these first couple of weeks uh, that we've implemented this at the high school for this semester uh, has, has been back and forth with testing. Um, uh, again, we're regrouping students after our Thanksgiving break. And um, we noticed that the students um, we're able to pull some of the students in, especially those that are in a in a kind of the middle of the road group right now, because I think our, our students that are struggling with reading rewards works for students that are above a third grade reading level. And we do have some students that are low. Um, and I think that that behavior piece and Tyler will talk about that a little bit too, just that that is a challenge for them when they're when they're in the, um, a group setting that's not everybody kind of on that same page. So that's a, a learning curve that we have as well. Um, we need to, uh, Ms. Patton reflected that our, our PD um, working through the assessment and the collection of data, you can see that we have a teacher that just inputted it wrong. I know she did the data collection, but what does that look like? And helping them um, determine, well, how is it good or bad that they're at this point um, and, and what does that look like? So we need to do some more um, professional development and coming alongside them as we coach them through that program, as we train them in uh, what rewards looks like. In the past, we've had success with this. And uh, when the program is implemented with Fidelity, um, we've had that opportunity. Another thing that I'll mention that uh, through our letters training that Heidi talked about earlier, um, we were fortunate to have a rewards trainer as also our letters webinar trainer. And so when he was um, when he was going through and giving information to us about letters and, and that knowledge base and the exercises he brought in, he used exercises directly out of the re rewards program because he knew we were also preparing to implement that. And so that just gave our teachers another boost that here, here's some reasons why this this is helpful and how this head knowledge that we're getting out of letters is gonna directly apply into the curriculum that we're using. So I'll let Tyler give some reflections um, from the teacher perspective. Alrighty, so hi guys, my name is Tyler. I am the social studies teacher here at Muskegon Heights. And this has been my third year doing rewards, but it has been uh, kind of crazy this year to start because we were online virtually all last year and um, that's a you know whole year not seeing the students in person and it's a whole year of them trying to you know I don't know get back into what we're doing right now so um, behaviorally and just kind of trying to have because I have the seniors um, this year so trying to have the seniors take something seriously that's like reading when they feel like they all know how to read and they are kind of set in their ways per se with reading it's been a challenge in that way but I feel like um, we're, we're getting somewhere with the structure here and I feel like um, the the rewards program is really straightforward and um, helping the teachers just feel confident and um, just, I don't know, doing a, a good job at implementing it and getting the, the students to interact and try to get better at reading. Mm -hmm. So um, like, like I said, I do, I work with the seniors. So um, the students are all over the place in terms of like their reading level and the pretest and the scores that I've got. So as we keep going and we get further into this, we can place the students where they, where they should be at. But um, that makes it difficult in class when I'm implementing this and we're doing, you know, back and forth, like, you know, um, just with the whole class and doing this. So, you know, some kids are further ahead and some kids are a little bit behind. Um, so I found that um, rewards works best if the students get it, um, and the students get the most out of it. If 
I meet them where they're at. So I spend a lot of time doing one-on-one -on -one with with students or putting them somewhat in groups where, you know, you know, because a lot of the friends have the same level, you know, and it kind of works that way. And that helps me out a little bit. But just in the days in some of the off time, I spend more time working with students to, you know, to catch them up and they know where they're at and they kind of, you know, they're kind of shy about it and, and they won't come straight forward and tell and, you know, let you know the, that they're a little bit behind. So um, I feel like, I, like I'm doing a good job in that. We only have like 27 minutes, but in the downtime, I catch up some kids to help them um, get back to where they should be. And so I feel like that's been going good with the one-on-one -on -one time and that works the best for me. Um, and then also going through parts of the lesson and letting some of the students work on their own. So like I said, um, you watch the, uh, the video and when we implement this, there's a lot of back and forth with the students and just slowing it down and showing the students to take their time while reading a word and breaking the word down into parts and not just trying to get through as fast as you can and making up the ending because that's been a big, a big problem that I've been seeing. Um, that's been helping a lot and um, just trying to make them because I'm a competitive guy. I'm trying to help them compete with themselves and just when they're, you know, trying like their scores, just try to help them improve and to slow down and just get the word right. That's I mean, that's been kind of the way I've been going with it. Um, and like I said, just focus on yourself and keep a learning mindset because I say they're seniors. I say, you know, I'm 27 years old and I tell them that I've been learning a lot with them and breaking down the prefixes and suffixes. I'm a social studies guy and I need to know this. And like I said, it's it's been helping me out as well. So just to be humble and to just we're in school, take this seriously and try to learn and take take from it what we can has been my, you know, my biggest thing. Like I said at the end here, just express to the students that there is something to get out of this. Right. They feel like they're, you know, little kids and I'm, you know, I feel like they're in elementary school. But I just say, listen, this will help us and, you know, to trust me. And like that's where that relationships we have with the kids comes into play a lot because, you know, if, if they trust you and you can let them know that this is not for no reason, this is important, they they, you know, they take it seriously. So that's what I got with that. So it's been going good and we're going to continue to keep growing and getting better and myself included, because there's, we all have a lot of room to grow. So, yep. Thanks, Ty. Just a couple quick things that I would say on the next slide, just some of the next. Uh, again, we're, um, we're regrouping. Uh, I think all of us wish that we would have had the pretest and all those things done ahead of time. And just with uh, the virtual learning aspect of last spring, that wasn't possible coming into the school year. And um, uh, we wish that we could have done more teacher practice sessions and used each other as, as students and kind of gone through and just worked on some of those formats um, ahead of time but uh, we're getting better at it all the time. And I think that's where we'll start to see the, uh, the motivation of the teachers. We've already seen that change just with the pre-testing results. And now once we can get the students grouped accordingly, I think that'll be even better. Our seventh through eighth grade students use this as well. Our um, uh, academy is seven through 12. And so our seven and eighth grade students um, they, they buy into it a little bit easier than our high school students who, again, like Tyler said, they think they know how to read um, and uh, sounding out words and going back to breaking it down into syllables um, seems a little bit elementary to them, but they're, they're starting to pick up a little bit. And so um, we're excited for those next few weeks as we go forward. So that's a little bit about our secondary uh, reading intervention that we've done for our literacy uh, focus this year. So thank you, uh, Tyler and Shelly, for taking us through the Secondary Rewards Program. Um, Heidi, Jen, and I, I want to talk a little bit about the final component of our expert literacy plan, which involves um, a cultivating genius book study. And Dr. Thompson referenced our Adinkra symbols at the start of our presentation today. And it's important to note this one because this one is kind of a big deal for us. It's about learning from the past, um, and it's supporting our children um, currently and into the future. So. Um, it, it's been really amazing to be able to forge a partnership with Dr. Goldie Muhammad. And if you're not familiar with her book, um, on the next slide, there is a, um, a little snapshot of her book. It's called Cultivating Genius. Personally, sometimes you have things come along in your life from a learning perspective, and it's really, um, it's life-changing. And this one was one of those for me personally. 
Um, she presents this historically responsive literacy framework from an equity lens. Um, and I know that we're going to talk a little bit more about that, um, the, the history or the historical um, connections to the framework that she has built. So um, in her framework, she has... Uh, she has five what, what are called literacy pursuits. So I'm going to hand it over to um, Jen Bauman to talk us through those, uh, to remind us of those literacy pursuits and how they connect to our goals. All right. With the um, this Cultivating Genius book, there is so much information in this book. And... Um, one of the things that we really want to focus on this year is her, uh, we were talking about the five literary pursuits. On here, it does show six, but um, we kind of added the call to action in there. Um, so first of all, we've got identity, and um, we want to make sure that the students see themselves in their learning. So this is why we have a focus <clears throat> on literature that um, is not what you would see in a, you know, maybe in a different school system. Uh, we also are working on the students' skills, students and teachers' skills with um, the letters, uh, reading mastery and our rewards and corrective reading. Um, and the skills um, are basically you know, just like what, what would you know about the, the content area? You know, just the, what you would normally learn in school about a subject. And with the intellect, um, this is where we are falling in with the cultivating genius, because this is, um, intellect is what we learn or understand about different topics, concepts, and paradigms. And so um, this is where the um, where we connect the intellect to action. So intellect and call to action are um, connected together. And then we've got criticality, and we want to make sure that um, with this we are trying to think. You know, how will the instruction? help to engage students thinking about power and equity and the disruption of oppression. So this um, criticality enables us to question both the world and texts within it to better understand the truth in history, power, and equity. And finally, with um, joy, we just want to make school a joyful place. I know a lot of times you know, you see students when you walk down the hallway, everything's silent. Kids are walking in straight lines. Um, this is um, real has been a uh, real big focus in the um, the past in the elementary schools, and now we want to focus on joy. There really is no reason why students can't be talking quietly amongst themselves on their way to lunch. You know. Um, or, you know, if they happen to be walking next to each other when they're walking down from lunch or, you know, instead of a straight line, that's okay, too. All right. Uh, I apologize. I'm, I'm working the screen and presenting right now. So I've got, you know, a couple different screens going. And so... Um, I've talked a little bit about identity. And so, as I said, it's composed of notions of who we are, who others say we are, and whom we desire to be. And so we really focused on black as a rainbow color last school year. All of the students, in, students, families in the district received a copy of the book, Black as a Rainbow Color. And this year, our focus is going to be on the undefeated. So again, students will see themselves in the literature.
The next liter literary pursuit is skills, as we talked about before. Goldie Muhammad defines this as competence, ability, and expertise based on what educators deem to be important for student learning in each content area and who develops the skills matters. And this is the sample, again, of what we've been doing as adult learners and the curriculum that we are presenting um, and we are using with our children. All right, so with intellect, the, it's the understanding, enhancement, and exercising of mental powers that all want to better understand and critique the world. And so we're really, really focusing on the teachings of Ladson Billings, Dr. Muhammad, and um, Paolo Freire with his um, liberatory education. And with Ladson Billings, it's the um, culturally relevant pedagogy. Criticality is the next literary pursuit, which Goldie Muhammad defines as the capacity to read, write, and think in ways of understanding power, privilege, social justice, or oppression, and particularly for populations who have been historic, historically marginalized throughout the world. We are working toward this. This is a big component of why we are learning to read. It's so that we can become critical, um, critical readers and thinkers. And then our call to action, which is opportunities to stand up speak up, make principled decisions, and carry out collective action against bias, exclusion, injustice, and prejudice. And again, this is something we are in progress with, and it's tied to the intellect that our teachers and students are working on. And finally, Joel is what, joy is one of our ultimate goals for our learning. And this is the opportunity for, to advance students' happiness by elevating beautiful and truthful images, representations, and narratives of self and others. So that gives you a little bit of behind the scenes of um, what the literary pursuits are. We're gonna turn it over to Heidi to talk us through what's next. So Jen, we've got two slides ahead for Heidi. All right, so what's next for Cultivating Genius? <clears throat> we use this book to guide our work, right? We start by asking ourselves these critical questions. When the curriculum text provided by the school is not enough, how will I respond as a critical and equitable educator? Critical and equitable. How will this text advance my students' learning of their identity of themselves or of other people's cultures? Is it a mirror or is it a window? How will this text advance my students' learning of the skills they need? How will this text advance my students' intellects? Is this text thought to get more than skills deeping into, in, into intellect? And how will this text advance my students' criticality? How does the text respond to the social times of the society? So we keep these in mind as we are choosing materials and curriculum for our students. Um, and to take us home is gonna be Dr. Thompson coming up with our overall what's next. While we wait for her to join us on stage, um, we just need to show you again, there's another symbol grounding us in our work, right? The Edrinka symbol of independence, freedom, and emancipation. Awesome, thank you, Heidi. Uh, what a team, right? You see why I come to work every day. It's the second reason why I come. The first reason are our students, because I hope you hear all this passion, all this excitement, and this is what we're bringing to our students because we want them to be passionate and excited and have joy of learning. And we think we can get them there through this legacy process. So what's next for us? We're, we're gonna embark on early childhood oral language instruction, elementary handwriting instruction, adolescent, young adult comprehensive reading instruction. And again, this is one of our books that we plan to just deep dive into with not only the rest of our um, staff and students, but our community as well. And we've done a lot, but we have a lot more to do. And we knew that this was going to be some uh, tough work. We knew it wasn't going to be a sprint, but a marathon. And so we're, we're trudging up the hill um, because we know once we hit that peak and we go down that other side, all of our students are going to be expert readers. And our whole goal for this pursuit is that we want to make students or we want to allow students to see the joy in reading. 
So we we thank you again for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about Muskegon Heights Public School Academy system and to experience some of the passion and, and excitement that we have heard and seen through this direct explicit learning in our reading programs. Um, I know there's very little time, but if uh, anyone has any questions, um, you can uh, hit on that um, QR code and you will have uh, contact information from us for us and we will entertain any questions that you have concerning our presentation. 